you know, I did work, I opened the Rainbow Room, which it was which was the old cabaret after dark lounge. Yeah, it becomes the, the Rainbow cabaret Room. Became the, first became the Rainbow Room, then became Avalon. But I could not work for the owner of the club. Yeah. And so you weren't there very long? No, I was there for like two months. I just, he made me very uncomfortable. But the Rainbow Room was successful for a little while, yeah. was it not? Yeah. Okay. Several DJs played there. I think Conrad played there. Yeah, I think Conrad, uh, yeah. Tony Porter mm -hmm. uh, played there as well. Uh, but you couldn't do it for very long. The owner of the club, uh, I forget his name right now, he was from New York. He, he <coughs> owned, uh, John Addison was his name. Uh, he had owned Les Jardins in New York, and he liked the young boys, mm -hmm. young guys. And, uh, I just didn't go for that. Yeah. So now we, I mentioned we early, uh, earlier this week, we were, I was asking you about um, speeds of records and how they were eventually started to climb with in BPM, in BPM yeah. and things yeah. like yeah. that. And was there a connection in any way to the drug culture at the time? Like, I feel like <coughs> for some reason I associate the higher speeds with, like, cocaine. I've thought about that after you posed that question to me, and I really don't think so. Mm -hmm. uh, because back you know, pre-disco, the, the drugs were LSD mm -hmm. and quaaludes. Which were very... Well, quaaludes are downers. Yeah. And, and they went from, you know, quaaludes to babich, which two and alls and, and second alls. And, and, and from, you know, the LSD, it went to MDA, which is now considered ecstasy. I mean, gay people and in the gay culture has always been so far ahead of mainstream society in that aspect, with music and drugs. And recreational drugs. And recreational drugs. I mean, I was doing K in the 70, 1974. Yeah. No one even heard of it. I had a friend who was a Stephen Kochler, he's passed away, uh, who was an anesthesiologist at um, Mass Medical. One, it's now Tufts, down, mm -hmm. down in the combat area. Yeah. I forget what the, the name of it is. Now. Yeah. It's now Tufts. Back then, I forget the name of it. So he helped, he secured some of this. Oh, he used to come over. My, my house was on his way home. And he used to come over to my house in the morning and he used to take vials of K from the hospital. And bring them. And bring them over to my house and yeah. we would indulge. Right. So, I mean, I guess, I, I, it's funny because I don't really have, I mean, I don't have a very judgmental sort of like attitude about it. I think it was sort of key to sort of the development of the culture and the music. Mm. I mean, but, a lot of the drugs. Not everybody did them, right. but, I, but, I, but what I mean is like that it, it sort of helped foster some sort of creativity or response or, you know, when you listen to old CD, old, old tapes of people like Roy Thode, I have a, a few of him at the Saint and at mm -hmm. Fire Island, and you listen to those mixes and you think, Jesus, the drugs must have been really good. <laughs> you know, because you, cause you, cause you, it's hard to imagine what it sounded like there, right. just listening to it on a tape 30, right. 40 years later, you think that it had to have affected the audience's response to some degree and also the furthering development of the music. I think, you know, a lot of it brought out creativity in the de with the DJ. Because DJs were very often DJing when they were on things. Right. Yeah. Right. Uh, the main drug, the main DJ drug, I think, and I always was the main, was, was marijuana. Was weed. Yeah. yeah. I could, I could never play on K. Yeah, right. I, forget it. I mean, I don't, and DJs who have, I don't know how they can, but they do right. somehow. And then there's also um, the advent of ethyl, right? Could never, could never play on ethyl either. Right. You spray it on a rag. You spray it on a rag, and you inhale it. And you inhaled it right. off the rag. Mm -hmm. um, so those are more for dancing. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these drugs were really for the dancers, they weren't so much for the DJs. Right. Um, but is there a difference between playing for a crowd on just alcohol, do you Definitely. think? Definitely. How's it different? Definitely. Alcohol, it, well, you probably know because you play in a, in a club that serves alcohol. Uh, <clears throat> 
you can get away with a lot more with, with a crowd that's enhanced with chemicals versus alcohol. Uh, there used to be, uh, back in the early 70s, uh, Jimmy Stewart's ex-lover, Tony Bosco, who was a uh, architect, owned a house that he had gutted out in Austin. And he, it was a nightclub, an after-hours club. And after the clubs, Jimmy Evangelista, Day Nine, Jimmy Stewart, myself, uh, Jimmy Fournier, would all go out there, and one of us would, on Saturdays and Fridays, Saturdays, Saturday nights, one of us would be scheduled to play. And that's when we played for one another. We didn't have to worry about, you know, our dance floor audience. And we would play, play for each other because mm -hmm. it was, you know, it was DJs. Great. It was like the in, the in crowd and, and some of our friends. So, the, the network of friendships and that sort of brotherhood of DJs is really instrumental in developing what's happening, not just in Boston, but probably in other places too. Well, we fed off each other. You fed off each other, you right. lived together. Yeah. So there was a community that was sort of helping foster this culture. But by the late 70s, we get to, I mean, I'm not, you, I'm not sure where you're DJing by then in the late 70s, because you said you kind of really went to chaps, right, yeah. by the early 80s is where, yeah. you're, where you start to get a, a more secure in terms of like pay and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So late 70s for you is still a period of like going from place to place. place to right. right. Um, but the Disco Sucks movement and the Disco is Dead movement starts to happen yeah. in right. the late 70s. So how do you guys respond to all of that? <coughs> what happened was is the production of music, domestic production of dance music, dwindled. But we just we went we went across the off across the pond. Yeah, you started getting a lot of European. All European music. Italy, Italy, Germany. Right. And that's where Carol Mitro and we would go to. Uh, in fact, I would had a a tab at downtown. On the, Downstairs Records in New York, and I called them up, and what do you got new? What, what, what's good? Without even hearing some of his music, I would buy it. Yeah. So where does Carol come into the picture in terms of becoming a, a seller and a DJ of records? I don't actually. Of all the people we've talked to about Carol, I don't know her origins. Neither do I. Like where? Like which club does she first start DJing at? I Chaps? No, I don't know. I think she DJed. Before, she had to have DJed before Chaps because right. she was she was a she was a good DJ. Right. I mean, it wasn't like she just wandered in. She wandered in with no experience right. and just did this yeah. because it's not something that anyone can just do. Right. Um, but when did she start selling records? When did you have a recollection of, of, of she played? Well she, well, she was playing at Chaps, and as a matter of fact, I used to do lights at Chaps to supplement my income mm -hmm. because I used to play two nights a week, mm -hmm. and so I used to at least like three nights do lights. And I did lights for Carol the last night she played at Chaps on her first stint at the club. So she had two stints? Yeah. Where did she go after? I don't the, know. Or she might have just taken the time off. And she may have taken the time off, but in that transition is when she opened Vinylmania. So in between her stints at, as a DJ, she opens Vinylmania. Why am I calling it Vinyl Connection? Was it Vinyl Connection? I think Vinyl Mania is somewhere else. But I think Vinyl Connection would be Vinyl the Connection. name of the store. Yeah. I still have the Hercat in my house, but it's a matter of <laughs> And her first location is the one next to Chaps. Right on the, right. Okay. Right. right. Um, and upstairs at Chaps used to be the New England DJs Association. Okay. That was the record pool that I belonged to. Okay. Uh, and I joined that one because at the time I lived down the Cape. I had moved out of the city. And I was living on the Cape and I was commuting back and forth. What years were this? I uh, moved out of the city in 82. 82. Do you, so do you get work in Provincetown? No, I was, just, no I was just still playing at Chaps. You're still playing at Chaps. Right. Okay, so you weren't really working down in Provincetown at no, all yet. No. But you do eventually. I played a couple of nights at the back, back room. Okay. In the Kidman Hotel. Okay. And then uh, I was working down in uh, the New Bedford area. Okay. So um, 
you have to start relying on European music more. Are, there, are, are the record pools helping you get secure this music, or are they still trying to source just domestic? I was just domestic. And then there's not much coming out. <coughs> not at all. I mean, I to the I was used to be so upset because I remember uh, record pool fees was seventy dollars a month. A month. And I would go in, I used to go in on Thursdays during the day, go up to the pool, get my records. Uh, actually, you know, excuse me, I think the membership for $50 a month, but I paid 70 because I subscribed to DiscoNet. Mm -hmm. And they got the DiscoNets for us. DiscoNet uh, is a remix service. The remix service. And the Hot Tracks was another one, and then Direct Hit, mm -hmm. there were several of them. Right. Uh, but I remember half of that stuff I threw out because it was, uh, this is when hip hop was starting to come around and rap and, and it was geared towards uh, the straight crowd. It was not, the music was not geared toward the gay crowd at all. Mm -hmm. And I was just, you know, if I got one record a month or two records a month, that would be something that I would, that I would play. So you're forced to look overseas. Oh, we were forced to. Yeah. But Carol Store comes along and helps you. And we didn't have to go to New York for it. You didn't have to go to New York for right. it. Now, were there other import stores here at the time as well? No. So but hers was really the first one. That was it. And, it. and she was successful because she was a DJ. She knew what was going to work. We've had this conversation a little bit before about the difference with, with Mary Alice, I think it was actually, about how people like Carol served a purpose as sort of a middleman or a gatekeeper so mm -hmm. what they were doing was they were using their own ear to filter out what they thought wasn't worth other DJs time correct and bringing in stuff that they thought was good and that was worth time so there was this hierarchy that would happen where you know that where it, to some degree what was being played in the city was dictated by what Carol thought exactly was good right so does that Become an issue for for you, anyone at all? I mean, do not you? Not at all. You're, so, I was because she had great taste. Oh, she had good taste, and you know, <coughs> even though there were some things that you know I didn't care much for. Or, right. You know, it, you know, nothing. I, music is not geared towards an individual. Yeah. No music is geared towards. It. It's you know, you either like it or you don't. Right. Uh, some of the things she had, I didn't care for. Right. But you knew somebody else might like it. Someone else might like it. It may, you know. I mean, I, I had played music that I hated. Yeah. yeah. I remember the first uh, one night, one afternoon, Thursday afternoon, I went into, into the, drove in, I was coming in in the afternoon, and uh, go up to the record pool, get my records, <coughs> get a sandwich, go into the club, right downstairs, and practice mixes, and, uh, and listen to my records. And I got this record, and it was like, it's raining men by the Weather Girls. Mm -hmm. So I put the needle on and I'm listening to the record. Two minutes in the middle of the record, not even two minutes, about a minute and a half into the song, I just went, oh no. I said that to myself out loud, oh no. But you knew it was going to be big. Because I knew. I was just, I'm going to have to play this till the day I die. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I played it that night. I mean, I, I worked out a mix out of Stormy Weather, uh -huh. the twelve, uh, the Disco Net remix, yeah. and, and played that song, and they went absolutely crazy. They went absolutely nuts. But I knew they were going to. As soon as I heard it, I was like, Ugh. And they didn't have any exposure to this music nope. on the radio or anything yet, so nope. their first exposure to it was in the club. Right. I guess it's hard for me to understand the sensibility then where people were so responsive to new music that they heard in a club because if you do that now and they don't know it, it's a, it's it, a very different reaction. It, no, it was the same way then. It was the same way. Yeah, it was the same way that what we used to do is we used to play things like that, new things, a little earlier as the club was filling up. Uh -huh. So people weren't, you know, they were just having their first drink, first or second drink. They were hearing and listening. Yeah. They weren't ready to, to right. stop partying and dancing yet. And that's when we would play that stuff. But would you say It's Raining Man was an exception? Like it was, That was an exception. It was an exception. It was definitely an exception. How about records like I Will Survive? 
I Will Survive was another one that was not an exception. It was an exception. It was an exception instant, right away. Instant, instant hit. Instant. But did you like it when you first heard oh, it? Yeah. You did. Yeah. As a so, matter of fact, I Will Survive is one of my very, very, I heard uh, Stephen talk about uh, word blends. Yeah. One of my few word blends yeah. was one with I Will Survive and I'm Every Woman. Yeah. And it was a 32 beat mix. Uh -huh. And it used to go, oh no, not I will survive. Right. It used to go, oh no, not I'm Every Woman. Right. So on the I'm, I would cross over. Right. So you, these were actually crossovers where you would take the lyrics from two different records and create a different phrase right. by mixing those two phrases. Right. Instead, those two instead of Gloria together. going, oh no, not I will survive, I made it go, oh no, not I'm every woman. Right. So, but, 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 there weren't, but not everybody, they weren't easy to pull off. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There weren't too many that really would work as, with, no. as well. So it was no. like, kind of like, like lightning in a bottle. They were a novelty. Yeah. So it was like getting lightning in a bottle when right. you would do it.